scripture reading for today is Matthew 27, 54. I'll give you a second to find that. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God.
Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord for the young people here in our church. Amen. Tia, beautiful, beautiful job. You notice it's a little quieter here today because all the kids are downstairs. <laughs> but I have a philosophy, and that is uh, if you hear no crying, then the church is dying. Amen. So we praise God for um, our kids uh, here in our church. And um, it's all part of, of, um, of God's plan, I believe, for us to know God in a personal way. And it begins when we are children, when we are young. And um, so we praise God for the dedicated teachers uh, that are teaching our kids downstairs. Um, we try to do it once a month on the third Sabbath of the month. And um, so make plans to, to have your kids there. We're not forcing anyone, but you know, if you like, we have that option, all right? Let's bow our heads as we pray this morning. Our Father and our God, once again, Lord, we thank you for this day, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to open your word and um, giving us the assurance of the Holy Spirit. And we pray now, Lord, that you may speak to us, speak to our hearts, help us to see Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we don't know his name. All we know is that he was there when Jesus was crucified. And uh, he was an important person because he was in charge of a hundred men. In fact, the word centurion, that's what it means. Somebody who's in charge of a hundred men, at least. And to be a centurion was not an easy thing. You had to go through several things in order to qualify, you might say, to be a centurion. But I believe that it was God's plan in, in, uh, in this circumstance for this man to be there and to witness the execution of Jesus Christ. And first of all, I would say that he had a conviction. Something happened between the time that Jesus was condemned to die and his actual death. Something happened inside this man's heart. There was a growing conviction as he witnessed Jesus on the cross and as he heard the words that came out of his lips, there was a growing conviction in his heart that this was no ordinary man. There was something different about Jesus. You see, he had been used to many executions before, so this was like no big deal. Just one more. But this was different. This was no ordinary criminal. He didn't look like a criminal. He didn't sound like a criminal. There was a conviction that maybe, maybe this man is something different. And then, of course, after that, there was a confession. He said something. After he witnessed the execution of Jesus Christ, after Jesus gave up the ghost, and after he died, and after he saw everything that took place, the earthquake and everything else, he confessed. He said something. Truly, this man was the Son of God. So we go from conviction to confession. So in order to confess who Jesus is, we first need to be convicted of who he is. And God is going to help us confess him. People need to hear. And this is just a, an amazing thing. How can this man, a heathen, a Roman, how can he have conviction? And how can he confess when everyone else around the cross was derailing Jesus Christ, was mocking Jesus Christ, was saying to him, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe. 
Those who knew the Bible, those who had a knowledge of the prophecies, those who were supposed to know who the Messiah was, at this time they were oblivious. They were mocking Jesus, making fun of him. So you need to have a conviction in order to have a confession. And everybody has to come to terms with Jesus Christ, who he is. And you either confess that you know him, or you confess that you don't know him. So this man had a conviction, and he confessed. And then there was a commitment. See, we need to have a conviction in order for us to have a confession and after that, it is a commitment. Commitment to whom? Or to what? Commitment to Jesus Christ. Once you and I know who he is and what he did for us, once we are face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ and his great sacrifice, hey, there is going to be a conviction in our hearts. And there is going to be a confession. But God wants us to go a step further. He wants us to make a commitment. And a commitment doesn't come with just one day. A commitment comes in every day. Serving him and honoring him in everything that we do. Who is this man? Who is this centurion? Well, the Bible gives us Several pictures, I believe, as to who he was. I want us to look at the first text, Matthew 27 and verse 54, our scripture reading. So I'd like for us to turn there. If you have a Bible, if you don't have one, there should be one in front of you. Matthew 27 and verse 54. Matthew 27, 54. If you have it, say amen. Amen. All right. The Bible says, Now when evening had come, there came a rich man. I'm sorry. I'm reading 57. It's 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So in this, in this instance, it doesn't give us his name. There is another story about a centurion in the book of Luke, chapter 7, and verse 1. So let's look at Luke, chapter 7, and verse 1. The Bible says in verse 1, Now when he concluded all these sayings, talking about Jesus, in the hearing of the people, he entered the city called Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. And they said, For he loves our nation. And has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house. The centurion sent friends to him saying. Lord do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore I did not even think of myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man also placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned around, and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those, in verse 10, who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. Who was the centurion? 
Could it be the same person? It's interesting that what Jesus said about him. He says, I have not found that much faith, not even in Israel. And then there's another picture of another centurion in the book of Acts chapter 10, right there on the screen. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. And here we are given, we are given his name. In verse 10 it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. And you know the story. He has a vision. And he sends for Peter to come and talk to him. And he actually does. He comes and talks to him and those around him. And they receive the Holy Spirit. Some people say, well, the centurion that was present at the cross could be this man, Cornelius. I mean, it's not far-fetched. The centurion who came to Jesus to heal his servant lived in Capernaum. And if you look at this map, Capernaum is right there. Right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Caesarea Philippi is right there. So, you know, the centurions were men of means. They were rich, well paid by the government. So he might have had a house up in Caesarea Philippi. You see, when you and I are face to face with Jesus Christ, there is going to be a conviction, there is going to be a confession, and there is going to be a commitment. What happened after this man heard of Jesus Christ through the lips of Peter? He was a champion for God. Because he was convicted that Jesus was the Son of God. No ordinary man. And I submit to you that we need to look at Jesus. We need to see the contrast between Jesus and the other person that was beside him, that, that was Barabbas. We need to see Jesus for who he is. We need to understand what he did. And what he did was he gave his life for each one of us. He walked that road up to Golgotha. Some people said somebody placed a crown of thorns upon his head for every bad thought that we have ever thought. His lips were bruised and battered and broken and busted for every bad word that we have ever spoken. His back was torn apart, was lacerated by the whip for every time that you and I have turned our backs on God. Those hands, those holy hands that were always employed in blessing others, those blessed hands were nailed to the cross for every bad deed that we have ever done. Those feet were nailed to the cross for every wrong decision and every wrong road that we have ever taken. That's Jesus. And so, as those soldiers were there at the cross, witnessing the execution of Jesus Christ, and, and some of them oblivious and, and trying to wager at the foot of the cross, if there was one argument for us to be against uh, gambling and wagering, it would be this picture. There they are, at the foot of the cross, wagering as to who was to get the loot. And that is the only thing that belonged to Jesus, this, his clothing. And so as this man, this centurion, looks up at the cross, he, he became convicted, convinced, and then a confession came. And then I believe a commitment from his heart. As you listen to this man, this centurion, 
as you hear him speak today, may we have a conviction. May we have a confession. And may we have a commitment to him. I'm a soldier, a Roman soldier. That should tell you quite a bit about me. I've seen everything and done most, things you can't tell your wife and kids. I was on active service down in Jerusalem among those godless Jews. Maybe I shouldn't say godless. It was because of their view of gods that caused most of the troubles around here. And there's been plenty of trouble around here over the past few years. That's why Caesar sent Pilate down here. It was just my luck to be sent here with them. Like I said, there's been plenty of trouble around here. Most of the trouble was religious. That's because your government was meant to be religious. You just couldn't separate the two. They're waiting for a Messiah. For years, they've been predicting the coming of the Savior. And every now and then, someone would claim to be him. In fact, I can remember about 30 years ago, down in a little town of Bethlehem, there was a rumor that the Savior was born in a stable. Bright stars, kings from faraway places came searching for him. Shepherds imagining seeing angels and so on and so forth. The story was really quite unbelievable. We just dismissed it as impossible. I was unlucky enough to be on service when the whole rigmarole of this year's Messiah came around. When this Jesus fellow showed up, he caused quite a stir. People claimed he could heal the sick, make the blind see, and the lame walk. They even claimed he could raise the dead. He really gave those priests a hard time, accusing them of corruption and confusing the method of serving their God. I believe that's why they wanted him killed. That, and because he claimed to be God, or God's son. Well, anyway, I'd done crucifixion plenty of times. It's barbaric, but you can get used to anything. I've done enough times I could do it with my eyes closed. The prisoner usually tries to run right before you drive the nails through him on a cross. I prepared for a struggle, but this Jesus didn't struggle. It's like he just laid himself on the cross. No fighting, no fussing, nothing. Just quiet. But he did scream when the nails got driven through his hands, but who could blame him? He's only human, right? You know, most people don't know this, but the nails, they don't go in the hands. They go in the wrists right here to hold the weight of the body. At one point, this man, he looked at me. I turned around quickly. I turned my back and got on with the rest of them. I called for the boys to haul him up. There were three of them that day. Once they were all up, it was business as usual. I could breathe a little. I could hear the puffing and panting as they fought for breath. Still, the other two still had enough left to curse in them. But everything was under control. I should have known better, really. I'll never forget that day. Never. It changed my life. I've only got to close my eyes and think back, and I'm there. I can remember every little detail. Like everything was moving at half the usual speed. Right on noon, the weather packed in. One minute, bright sunshine. The next, dark clouds moved in, blackening the sky. Everything was dark. Thunder and lightning raged in the sky. The people were crying, calling out to their God. So was I. 
but I wouldn't dare do it out loud. I couldn't let them hear me. I had to seem like I was in control, even if I wasn't. I had to maintain order, you know? The temperature plummeted. Titus was all right. He was wrapped up in a garment he had worn playing dice. I was frozen. You could smell the rain in the air. You know that musty smell just before it comes down? But then it came. An absolute downpour, thunder and lightning raged in the sky. You'd think it would go away. You know, it just stayed there. Three hours it lasted. I really got the jitters. Perhaps he was right. He was the son of God. And his dad had just got mad. Then the prisoner called out. I couldn't understand him because it was in his native language. I don't think many others did either. There was a lot of discussion about what he had said. One person claimed he was calling out to Elijah, one of their prophets. Someone else said he was calling out for God because God had left him. But who could blame him with the weather and all? I was miserable. I stuck a sponge on a stick and I ran up the ladder with some spiked vinegar. You know, pain relief. He looked at me then. I can't describe the depth in his eyes. It's like he said he was thankful. He said, I don't blame you. It's not your fault. This is all bigger. Much, much bigger. When I got down to the bottom of the ladder, he was dead. I've seen plenty of men die, but none like this man. A crucified man can take days before he dies, but not this Jesus. It's like some other agony too deep for words finished him off. It seemed to me that all of heaven was in mourning. But then the sun came out, just like that. That's not the end of it. They pulled him down and they buried him, and we rolled a big stone in front of his tomb. I think we were told to do that because he had told people that he would only be dead for three days. Don't you know that this man went missing? Some people claim they've seen him, but for the most part, he hasn't been seen since. For those who've seen him, they say that when he returns, he's going to bring all of heaven with him. And when he does, we're all going to see him. I thought about all of this a lot, you know. He and I, we were caught up in something far beyond politics, something bigger than ourselves. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'd like to think he was the Son of God. So if he was, I know he's forgiven me. And so we come to you. You see, the reality is that the Bible says that he was bruised for our iniquities. He paid the price for our sins. Why would someone go through that? There's only one answer. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And every one of us, every one of us, has to answer that question. What will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? If there is a conviction in your heart, then that is the Holy Spirit working in your heart. If there is a conviction, then there must be a confession. We have to confess. We have to tell the world. We have to say to others who Jesus is. Not only through words, but through, most importantly, through our lifestyle. 
And that will lead us to a commitment. A commitment that will last from now until he comes. And so today, as we consider this story of this man who came, you might say, to his senses, we have to do the same thing. See, there is no heaven without Jesus. And there is no heaven without you and me. And so I want to make a commitment to God today. Because I need Jesus too. And Jesus died for me. For everyone. So I want to be the first one to say, Lord, I confess that you are the Son of God. What does that mean exactly? That means that there is hope for us. That means that the, the doors of heaven are open. There is a big welcome sign inviting us to come in because the price has been paid by Jesus Christ. That means that there is help for me today in the problems that I face and the challenges that I have in the struggles that I fight every day. There is, there is hope for me. We're not alone. Heaven is here. Amen? Amen? And so, I want to have a special prayer as we close today. Our Father and our God, here we are. Sinful human beings trying to get a glimpse of heaven trying to experience Jesus in our hearts. Father, open the doors. Let the light shine in. Let the portals of heaven open. Let us see Christ. Let us not only see him, Lord, let us confess him that he is the Lord, that he is the Son of God. And let us make a commitment that we want to serve him for the rest of our lives. If that is your desire, I want, I want to see your hands. Put your hand up if that, if that is your desire. I want to serve God. Amen. And amen. We pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.
Father in heaven, once again, Lord, we thank you because you were willing to die for all of us. Shed your blood to give us hope. You are in heaven now, but soon you will come back. We pray, Father, that the conviction of who you are may lead us to confess you by word and by deed in everything that we do. May we be committed to you, Father. Help us. And we thank you, Father, for giving Jesus for us. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 Please be seated and the deacons will usher you up. Thank you. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath.